Visual programming refers to a style of programming that allows the user to specify programs in two or more dimensions. Visual programming environments represent either the data, the control flow, or the program state in a graphical way, allowing them to be directly manipulated rather than specified using symbols. And I guess tying it back to the direct manipulation, it's that I want to be able to use my visual cortex to see the state of the system in addition to its process to be able to have an understanding of what it's doing without having to switch back and forth between two representations so I can be in the flow, so I can better understand and experiment with what the heck is going on. Hi, this is Sri. I'm a YC alum and a research engineer focused on natural language processing for search. Hi, this is Will. I'm a YC alum who's an independent researcher that has worked across e-commerce, cryptocurrencies, and financial industries. Welcome to the Technium, where we talk about the edge of technology and what we can build with it. An optimistic look at the road ahead. We're two guys discussing edgy, fringe, or overlooked technologies over a couple of drinks. Our show has four segments. First, we give a high-level overview of what the technology is. Second, we talk about what it can do today. Then, we let our imaginations and optimism take over and see how the world would change if the technology was readily adopted everywhere. Lastly, if we believe in this future, how can we take a position on it? We can't be experts in everything we cover, so if you've got insights into this topic, let us know in the comments. And be sure to check out our audio versions on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. But first, what are we drinking today, Will? Uh, I just have uh, some health aid kombucha. This is common in our fridge, and so this is what I'm drinking today. It's a pink, pink lady apple flavor with a smiling walking apple, as you can see here. Nice, cute. Uh, I'm also drinking kombucha. I got I'm revisiting the rowdy mermaid. I think it made an ex- uh, appearance in season two or something. Uh, this is watermelon bloom flavor. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think this brand of kombucha is also common <laughs> in in my episodes over here. So, <laughs> so I don't I don't blame you over there. Yeah, I don't know. Kombucha it's supposed to be healthy, but when I look at the amount of sugar in this, I'm just like, oh, this might as well be a soft drink. Now, kombucha is definitely riding a wave of popularity now, and uh, I think people are making it a lot more palatable than it should be. Originally. Right, right. Because <laughs> I, I had kombucha that somebody made from scratch. I'm like, this is disgusting, but apparently it's healthy <laughs> for me. So this is way different. So uh, welcome back, Shri. This is season four. How, how are you feeling? Yes. I'm super excited. I think we, when we started this podcast, we didn't really expect that we would get to a season four. At least I had no idea how far we'd go. So but here we are, and I think we've still got a huge backlog of ideas to cover. So, yeah, I'm super excited to, to see what we get get up to this uh, this season. Yeah, I mean, thanks to all of our viewers. I mean, like, since we finished season three, we've gained another maybe about 100. We're closing, to, closing in on 200, which we're, we're excited about. So tell your, yeah. tell your folks, tell your friends, and uh, tell them to listen to our podcast. Because today, what are we talking about for the very first episode of season four? Yeah, so... This week, we are talking about visual programming. Visual programming refers to a style of programming that allows the user to specify programs in two or more dimensions. Visual programming environments represent either the data, the control flow, or the program state in a graphical way, allowing them to be directly manipulated rather than specified using symbols. It's been a hot area of research from the very beginning of computing, actually, and it still continues to be today. So this week, we're going to cover a few major visual programming environments, why visual programming has remained compelling over the decades, and whether there's still untapped potential today in these ideas. Yeah, I mean, this is a huge topic. Uh, Visual programming is one of those umbrella terms that covers way too much. So I know that 
we're not going to be able to cover everything and definitely we aren't going to be able to cover your favorite visual programming language for sure. But what, what we can do is go over some of the notable examples and talk about like where we see this sort of thing going. And so I think where we'll start is the very beginning because the idea of visual programming actually goes way, way back to computer history that I think even most modern programmers aren't well aware of, like, where did all this stuff come from, right? And so I think that's where we'll start off. For sure, yes. So the very first visual programming languages were basically contemporaneous with the very first personal computers, or even prior to the personal computer, just the very beginning of, of computing history really famous example is Sketchpad by very early pioneer Ivan Sutherland. This is a programming environment which uses a screen and a light pen, and the user can draw shapes on the screen and then specify constraints, physical constraints on these, obje- uh, on these lines and shapes, and use it to basically model 3D objects in, in, in space. Yeah, I mean, to get give you an idea of how old that is, it, when Sri says a screen, it's actually an oscilloscope. Like, they basically hacked it so that it's able to draw letters and, and things on the screen um, instead. And so that, that goes way back into before personal computers were available to the public. These were kind of like research-level uh, projects like Sketchpad. And one of the things they had was being able to draw out things and be able to constrain it. So like you see the demo where you draw a rivet and it's not quite the same shape, the right shape. So you set some constraints and then the computer will iteratively figure out like the right shape for it. And then you can see in the demo that you can make classes of things and instances. And so Shri, you mentioned in the the pregame that when you're watching it, like, well, what's so interesting about this? And then you're like, (laughs) Oh, right. Right. Yeah, no, it, it's it's this kind of effect where you go back and you read classics or you look at something very old and prototypical that spawned a whole genre. And uh, it seems really cliche because everything that has come after it is basically mimicking that thing. Uh, but it's, it's really uh, important to remember that Sketchpad and a lot of these other retro environments that we're talking about today were the first time that anybody had seen things like... Uh, you know, drawing shapes on a screen and specifying constraints, which now you see in all kinds of 3D modeling software, CAD software, for example. Uh, and so it seems uh, quite commonplace, but I think that was probably the first time that it's been done. Yeah, I mean, like, it's like J.R.R. Tolkien. When people that are, like, sci-fi fans, modern sci-fi fans, go back and read Tolkien, they're like, uh, I mean, this is all, but, like, <laughs> so much stuff has spawned from it, like elves, dwarves, that, like, the whole stereotypical stuff, it came, uh, it all came from uh, the book. And so one of the things that's different about the, some of this retro stuff is that if you look at it, you can be surprised that, how modern it seems, but also there's some things that uh, that modern software doesn't do that it does. And so we'll, we'll get to some of that in some of the other examples. So I think the, yeah. the next example we have is Pygmalion. You want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Pygmalion is interesting because it's probably the first example of now a, a pretty common pattern of wiring together blocks of, of control flow. So Pygmalion is a basically 2D canvas in which you can specify inputs and then feed them through uh, things like if statements and and functions and things like that, which are represented basically by blocks. And the interesting thing, though, that Pygmalion had that current data flow and wire-based environments don't have is programming by demonstration. So actually, yeah, what what is programming by demonstration? <laughs> You're asking me? Yes. Um, uh, so in, in watching the demo, uh, what it looked like is akin to how Smalltalk programmers program in which you draw and like you write the code. So let me back up. Smalltalk programmers are used to an environment in which if you write a code and the computer is executing it and it runs into a function that it doesn't have an implementation for, instead of just erroring out and crashing, 
it'll ask you like, oh, I don't know how to run this thing. Can you implement it? And then once you implement it, you can just keep on running. It's the same thing in Pygmalion in which you're able to draw an example with icons and then fill in the details of how it should execute as it goes on. And so as you dig into it, you're able to provide the values uh and then uh, as examples and then watch it execute uh, as it goes on and once you fill in the examples you're able to like continue on with your execution i think it's more apparent when, when uh, for those of you that are watching on youtube uh you can see the demo as i'm talking here uh, but for those of you that are listening on a podcast on audio form we have uh, links in the resources uh, and so you can check them out after you stop driving please please don't crash your car <laughs> yes yeah I thought that Pygmalion was interesting just because I hadn't heard of programming by demonstration until we started looking into a lot of these old old concepts for visual programming and I think they're going to come back now with a lot of the advanced technology that we have that's a bit of a preview for the, the later sections so yeah Right. And so uh, we don't even cover the full gamut of the retro stuff, but like, what's the other significant one that gets mentioned a lot when you like look into visual programming and uh, the tools for thought sort of people? <laughs> well, the, the conversation cannot be complete without mentioning HyperCard. So HyperCard is a visual programming environment that allows the end user to construct simple programs using stacks of cards as a main abstraction. So you you have cards that can display information. They can be wired together in various conditional logic to walk you through different types of flows. And uh, it's basically a, a hypertext system that all, is also a kind of GUI builder. Uh, that's right. And then uh, I also want to mention Grail, which Alan Kay seems to uh, really like a lot. And when you look at the demos, what's surprising is the system's so old, they're also using an, oscill an oscilloscope there. But they have a light pen, and they can do handwriting recognition on computers that slow from, like, I don't know, the 60s or something like that. And so it's pretty amazing that you can just draw boxes and recognize that it's a box and convert it. And so uh, check out the demos, but like you're able to do some of these um, direct manipulation of your program and the processes, and they have uh, mechanisms for abstraction and data tables in there. And in some ways we've kind of copy the surface level of some of these systems and I feel like we've kind of missed some some deep essence of some of these uh, uh, older systems. Yeah, I think we're going to be covering a lot of what these initial visionaries were thinking about and uh, the extent to which now their visions can be realized in the modern day in the uh, kind of back back end of this episode. Yeah, and the last retro one I wanted to mention was Viewpoint. This one's really funny in that when I saw it, I understood what I was looking at. Uh, it made me laugh. Uh, basically, Viewpoint is a, an exploratory system in which the entire state of the application is visible as a bitmap. And so, if, for example, if you want to... Uh, on the screen is a picture of a keyboard. And if you want to reprogram your keyboard so that typing the the F key will give you another symbol. What you do is you redraw the letter F, the picture of the letter F on the screen. And when you do that, you change what letter you type on the screen. And you can do that because the program is looking at the same picture that you are and deriving its behavior from that. And so I thought that was a really interesting uh, way of thinking about programming. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it looks a little goofy, but uh, it's it's kind of a fun and a, a very uh, um, concrete way to interact with a with a computer because uh, it, it yeah. draws what you drew basically. Right, right, and and I think what the it goes back to the idea of like what is programming and uh, a program that can parse its visual structure to know what its state is like that's an underexplored avenue i think and so that that's one of the main reason why i mentioned it in in the retro stuff but yeah definitely there's a lot of stuff that we can go over but i think it's to, time to move forward in time to like what, what where has 
visual programming languages come to today? Like where have people kind of gravitated towards in in the I guess the latest iterations? Yeah, I think there are a few main interaction paradigms that have prevailed over time. The uh, most famous one or maybe the most used environment is a block-based environment. So a block-based environment you can imagine is a, a programming environment where you take the control flow structure such as uh, if statements and while loops and function calls and things like that and um, and you drag them around on screen like Legos and stack them and connect them to each other uh, to build your program. The most famous example of which is Scratch. Scratch is a project from MIT, which is meant to be a programming language for kids or uh, maybe adults who are new to uh, uh, the idea of programming. It's supposed to be friendly. And the interesting thing about Scratch is that, well, two interesting things. It's a, It's an entire programming environment. So not only are you programming using blocks, but you're also able to manipulate a, a kind of live visual environment so that you can make things like animation and games and things like this. Uh, and the other interesting thing is that it's really been taking off in recent years. I think that a lot of people who are entering the field of computer science nowadays uh, are starting from uh, from scratch, uh, so to speak. And uh, uh, Does that mean middle schoolers and high schoolers, or are you talking about university students? Uh, actually, in, in the university that I attended, there was a kind of pre-intro to computer science class that was taught in a Scratch-based uh, language. So I think basically oh, okay. everyone, actually, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, f- uh, for those of us, uh, so, so for those of you on audio, basically, uh, when we say block base, it's that imagine instead of like being able to type if like there's these puzzle pieces that you can drag into the programming canvas. And so certain statements can only go after certain other statements. And so those are the only puzzle pieces that would fit together. Because one of the hard things for early learners of programmers is to understand and remember the syntax. Like oftentimes the compiler will tell you cryptic error messages about where you screwed up, like unmatched parens or like found EOF at the like at the <laughs> before with an unclosed like people don't know what that means when they're starting out programming and so like the compiler is a terrible teacher but like most of us that grew up in an era in which that's all we had before stack overflow or the internet like we think that that's how you learn programming but it's totally not and so when you have block based pieces like people that are just starting especially kids can just like drag things in, see what fits. And so they can focus on the core concepts rather than the details of like, you have to match the, the quotes for strings or you have to match the ends of the parentheses and stuff like that. And so I think that's why, uh, that that's one of the things that uh, is really good about the block-based programming. But I, I think in addition to that, like Scratch, I think is developed under the guidance of Alan Kay as well. And so they really push the small talk version of object-oriented programming. And so everything is inspectable, runnable. And so for those of you that are curious about small talk, you can refer back to our small talk episode to kind of see what that was all about, which reminds me that you should click and subscribe to our <laughs> channel if you're interested at all uh, about this sort of stuff because we find that a lot of technology references back onto itself so if you want to get all the latest or scoops retro or otherwise then then yeah, hit that subscribe button so so yeah i mean mm-hmm. like are, do you have anything else to add to like block based programming like why uh, people have latched onto it as like a visual programming language i think the other thing that i like about Scratch or other block-based programming languages is that you build the program out of these puzzle pieces or Legos or basically these composable parts, right? And the way that you do this is that you have a basically parts bin on the side where you can see like, these are all the types of blocks that I have and, uh, and browse through them and then drag the ones that you think are relevant to your current program. 
which is actually something that you don't have if you just look at a text editor, right? You're faced with a blank file. You have no idea what to type, especially if you're new at the thing. You're probably just copying, pasting it from somewhere or you have to refer to some external source. There's nothing in there that gives you an affordance of what's possible in this language. And and that's something that block based right. things solve. Yeah, and at best, like you have a... Uh auto completion but you still have to like know the first letter of whatever it is that you're looking for and it's yeah. often like alphabetically ordered for you it's not conceptually ordered for you so like you you still need to like look up documentation to to know what you're looking for yeah exactly so so i think it, it makes sense for a beginner's programming language and it's obviously been taking off the other major paradigm beyond block based is wire and data flow paradigm. Uh, This is something that people actually most commonly think about when they think about uh, visual programming is a type of programming in which you have uh, nodes and you have edges between nodes. And so the the nodes can maybe represent uh, functions or variables, depends on the, the environment that you use, and then you wire them together into some large graph which represents your computation graph. Uh, I think a very, very famous uh, environment like this is LabVIEW. This is actually used in a lot of engineering applications to build software that is used to control power plants or some type of machinery, this kind of thing. It's mostly in the kind of like the instrumentation uh, sort of world. Uh, like when, when, when you say engineers, like not software engineers, but like no, people that engineers. actually work. <laughs> yeah, right. Real engineers that work at a, like a bench or something like that. And so they're able to create a uh, software in which they're reading data from sensors or, or something like that. I've actually used LabVIEW before and... <laughs> I don't know. I, I kind of think it's all right. Uh, one of the things that I found difficult about it was modeling control flow. And it's just that in a sequence of steps, modeling sequences of steps that can loop or branch in a node and edges sort of modeling tool can get busy and messy pretty fast. And you can either spend your time wiring things up or you can spend your time like laying things out neatly and i guess it's the same conundrum except now you can easily waste a lot of time just moving stuff around like just to make things understandable and so i think there are ways to group and abstract as well but i think most people that are using lab view are not professional engineers and they're not like building huge systems out of it so they're always really messy yeah i i use lab view as well it was the programming environment that was used in the first robotics competition. It was a high school robotics competition. Mm, yeah. And so I was the programmer for this in high school. I had no sense of what uh, abstraction was. And so the entire logic for the robot was in this huge layout, uh, a big nest of wires. And uh, I could hardly figure out when something was breaking, where to find the node to uh, fix it so yeah i can imagine it can be quite hellish <laughs> yeah i mean like what did you at the time did you just like i guess this is what programming is <laughs> or were you like well it's messy because i made it messy uh no no i had uh sufficient ego to believe that i was really good at it and that was how <laughs> programming worked <laughs> right, right, right right yeah like uh I, I, you can see that in forum posts for like high school students like yeah i learned uh C and moved on to C++. I think I'm pretty cool. Like I'm like A plus programming expert. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I think the wire wiring uh, data flow model is prevalent in across a lot of visual programming languages. If you ever see a gallery of visual programming languages, you'll, you'll see it right away. And I think there's a certain attraction to it. And I think it's been pretty good for very domain specific modeling tool such as uh, one common one is the unreal engine uh, blueprint and unreal engine is a game engine in which parts of the programming can be done in this like node and wires uh, paradigm and you can uh, create effects and you can see that in the website blueprints from hell there are a lot of people that 
don't quite have a sense of cleanliness, but maybe it's just because they didn't have the time or people's thoughts are messy. So the output that they have is messy. Um, But either way, you can reify the things that are in your head without knowing how to program and just by understanding what these bits of functionality are and wire them together. Yeah, I think that there are lots of instances of this wire data flow in in all kinds of environments where there are other types of creative professionals who maybe know a lot about their domain and have a good sense of the kind of logic that they want, but they might not necessarily be programmers. One that actually comes to mind as well, uh, in addition to Unreal Engine Blueprint, is Max MSP. Uh, this is for digital music creators. So you can imagine people who create sound effects or uh, EDM type music, electronic music. Uh, and so it's it's something very similar. The way that it models itself is actually after modular synthesizers. These are uh, actual physical machines that mm-hmm. uh, take in uh, audio signals as, as input and they have parameters that can make it sound different ways. Add reverb, for example, is a simple example. Yeah. And yeah. then pipe their audio channel output to other units. And so Max MSP is basically a wire data flow version of, of that. And you can make quite complicated and cool music. Mm, I see. Yeah. And uh, in addition to music, uh, Houdini, Nuke, and Blender all have embedded visual like uh, programming languages for visual effects. And there are also ones like cable.gl and nodes.io in which you can make this sort of thing. And for me, what all of these domain-specific programming languages that leverage the node and wires model have in common when I look at it is that they are functional transformations of data. You have some sort of input. You can throw a bunch of functional trans- transformations between the input and output and wire them up together. And so sometimes you can do branches and whatnot, but for the most part, what you're doing is moving things through a functional pipeline. And so I think this model, visual programming with the nodes and wires is a very, very good fit for this. And so I think that's why we see uh, it as common as it is in these like uh, domain, visual and audio domains. Yeah, actually, signal processing, basically, whether it's uh, audio or, or visual or something like that, signal processing in general is a basically a functional pipeline. And so I I can see why it lends itself very well to that. Um, And then on the much more mundane and less creative side of things uh, are our workflow and data flow software. So these are basically the kind of uh, data munging that happens in in enterprise environments. Uh, So... Uh, you can think of environment uh, programming environments like uh, IFTTT, if this, then that, uh, or Zapier, for example, which are basically take in inputs from various uh, SaaS tools or, or other cloud-based uh, tools and then pipe around the data and then ultimately dump it somewhere. Maybe they put it into a spreadsheet, an air table, they send out some notification, these kind of things. Uh, are also modeled using this wire data flow paradigm. Yeah, but the uh, intent here, I think, is a little bit different because oftentimes in a company, you have people that need data and need to move it around, but it's it's work for a programmer that is super boring. Like, no programmer really wants to do this type of, like, data munching and integration work. And two... Um, if you can offload it to people that are non-programmers, it frees up the programmer for work that you actually need a programmer for. And so this sort of thing is a boon. Because I think a lot of times you just, even just like SQL queries for a database, I, I honestly wish that more non-programmers would learn SQL and that databases were more resilient 
against falling over with a query so that it, it frees up people's times or, or at least frees up my time as an engineer. And so I think it, it, in the sense that it's boring, it's it's the boring stuff that makes these things go around because were it not for spreadsheets, I can't imagine the workload that engineers would get from like, oh, I need to do this computation or I need you to build me this app, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. These are... The users of these environments are typically some type of business analyst or maybe a, a product manager or something. Right, right. But even then, like as an engineer, like connecting up some of this stuff, like integration, like I have data in this service through this API and I need to like pipe it over here. That's super boring work that like I don't want to do by programming like it's even a boon huh. for me to to like be able to pipe something somewhere where then i can like uh consume it w without like because like when you ha do integration work you have to go read the documentation and figure out like what the bespoke authentication scheme is and then yeah, like whatever right. the rest <laughs> api look for the specific one you need with the specific version and sometimes it's undocumented like uh like we we don't we don't um disparage any services here but i'll say like netsuite is terrible on that front <laughs> so, <laughs> so um yeah i mean they're, they're they're like bought by oracle by now or something like that so they don't care me say uh, about me saying this sort of stuff but like uh, i i can't say i had a great experience with them and makes sense they they're not catering toward developers but you can very well like run into this sort of situation and it's not just like developers don't just integrate with apis that have great documentation like yeah. like uh, always right and so having this sort of thing can be a boon to regular working engineers as well interesting yeah uh i guess it it uh Helps everybody. Rising tide lifts all boats. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. So. But yeah, that, moving on. Yeah, moving on. Um, that's the wire and da data flow. Block based and wire data flow are probably the two main paradigms that people think about. Uh, today, there are others at today, least. at least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there are others, and the, uh, visual programming is quite a nebulous concept uh, that people can count all kinds of things under. Uh, we're just going to touch on a, a few of them. Uh, when people think about visual programming, they might also be referring to things like UI builders, things like uh, no-code tools like Bubble and such. Um, and then there are other ones as well. Obviously, spreadsheets are a very, very popular environment which do have programming capability, and in some sense, they are multidimensional uh, so you could think about them as visual programming. There are, uh, sorry, do you want to say something there? Yeah. I mean, also there's bi-directional editing of the libraries like Xstate. Uh, Xstate's like a state management library for React, but like what you can do is you can, uh, write state code and then visualize a, uh, state machine for it. And then if you change, the picture, your code will change and vice versa. And so in some senses that that is like a visual programming language because when you change the picture, the code changes. And I mean, this is all to say that when somebody says the word visual programming language, it's like a huge umbrella term and it's not very accurate either. And like that's why like this can be a really big topic and we're acknowledging that some people might consider these things but we're not going to kind of dig too deep in it to it but also that it's a terrible term it's kind of like <laughs> yeah. if you if you categorize movies based on like what lens or what movie camera that they used um it's it doesn't quite fit or like in games like games have terrible genre names like for example we call first person shooters or like fps's but i mean like portal is a puzzle game with a first person perspective but you know like we know that that's not an fps but why it's a first person right is it just because you don't shoot well i mean you shoot beams so i mean it's a terrible <laughs> genre thing right uh genre yeah. name but that's just kind of like what we got stuck with yeah 
so I think that cl- that muddies the waters, but I think we'll try we'll try to keep it focused. Um, and and in fact, the interesting parts about visual programming, at least to me personally, are more on the conceptual level than any particular yeah. instantiation of a particular UI or something like that. Right. Right. And I think that that's the interesting part of our conversation because I think that there's some of these attempts, in my personal opinion, miss the forest for the trees as a result. Um, and so I, I think the, the conceptual, interesting conceptual things are what should drive this idea of visual programming rather than the these like specifics, which is why we tried to run through these examples as fast as we could, but just to kind of give you an idea, a, a buffet, if you will, of like what sort of things have been done and what's sort of out there now. Indeed. And if you're interested in just other tangential topics um, around things like visual programming, uh, check out our other episodes. Uh, we have a great episode on end-user programming. We have an episode about dynamic land, which could be considered a physical visual computing environment. Uh, and if you <laughs> oh, like yes. It- <laughs> uh, well, to interject there, a lot of the visual programming uh, practitioners and implementers are widely influenced by Brett Victor, who is currently working at Dynamic Land. And so if you have any inclination at all to look at this stuff, like definitely Brett Victor, if you haven't heard of him already, would have a lot to say on this topic. Indeed, yes. So check out that episode and uh, the, you know other work uh, in the show notes that we link out to. And also, if you uh, haven't already, give us a like or subscribe. I uh, would super appreciate it. Indeed. So, I mean, like, so what are these, like, conceptual things that you're talking about when it comes to visual programming? Yeah, so visual programming has a very, very rich conceptual history. I actually was completely unaware of it before we started (laughs) researching this episode. Yeah, I would (laughs) say most programmers. I mean, the CS curriculum at schools don't teach a history of computing, which I'm starting to think that they should, honestly, because like we reinvent things over and over again. Yeah, exactly. And and it's it's very interesting to go back and read some of these early papers about how people were thinking about programming because at that time, the concept of programming as a practice and as an activity was not yet fully formed. And so people were thinking about it from first principles that were grounded in much more ancient and abstract fields like linguistics and um, philosophy, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a great example of this is the paper that introduced Pygmalion, which we referred to earlier. Mm -hmm. And the first two sections of that paper were entirely about the philosophy of uh, how humans think about ideas and how ideas are represented in a variety of ways through words and speech and language in, in one camp and in the other camp through symbols and imagery. And uh, and it, it alludes to, you know, ancient Greek philosophers. It alludes to great artists. It, it's, it's quite a cultural experience to, to read this. Uh, but, but basically the idea that it um, espouses or tries to push forward is that there are these two camps of representation. Uh, one, uh, it calls analogical, which means that within the environment, the programming environment, there is some type of object or concept, let's say, uh, that you're trying to manipulate. And the analogical representation is basically the visual representation, uh, a representation that looks like the thing that you are manipulating. So, for example, Mm -hmm. in the Sketchpad uh, example, the the objects there, uh, let's say that you're designing furniture or a building or architecture or something like that, have an analogical representation in that they behave like 3D objects and you can manipulate them as though they were objects. Mm-hmm. The The other type of representation is a kind of linguistic representation where rather than visualizing that thing, you are simply giving it a name, right? So you're, you name some variable 
you call something a list. You don't view it as a list, for example. You just say this is a list, right? In most uh, modern programming languages, you say a new list, right? And that yeah. doesn't look anything like a list. And yeah. so the Pygmalion theory is that most pro programming languages use linguistic descriptions of the thing that they're manipulating, and that's a kind of too abstract. It doesn't give you a sense of the object that you're referring to. Whereas if you were to able to visualize it, then you're able to kind of touch it. You're able to look at what it is, what it looks like, and then get a sense of what you might be able to do to it, in fact. It gives you a sense of the operations that can be performed on it. It's kind of abstract, but uh, that's the kind of grand idea uh, uh, that it, it pushes forward. And I think that's like actually an idea that you can see throughout uh, a lot of these early uh, visual programming pioneers uh yeah i mean the <laughs> we started with how to augment human intellect and today i think most people think of technology as a way to view cat pictures i mean i'm being flippant but i, I think most people don't think of it as, as augmentation of their intellect per, per, perhaps aus augmentation of status or or augmentation of their uh so, the the social aspects. I think the social aspects of computing were drastically underestimated, um, and so maybe if there were papers on that, we, we'd have a, a a different world here. Uh, but but <laughs> I think I think what what you were talking about with like how you learn is, is really interesting because I, I think recently that I was watching a strange loop video. Uh, and they mentioned about, I think, Terrence Tao, how people, uh, according to Terrence Tao, how people learn mathematics. And so apparently he outlines it in three steps in which you do things in an informal way to kind of grapple through what this thing might be. And only when you kind of get a lay of the land, then you switch modes into formalism, where it's what traditionally math is known for but once you do the formalism then you back out again and you go back to the intuition informed by the formalism so that you understand the constraints and stuff like that and so i think it's interesting that pygmalion uh talks about how people learn as a way to augment like human thinking human like how do we come up with creative ideas and so i, I think these uh, like people building these systems at the time, and I guess to some extent today, but l I guess less so, a smaller percentage of all the working programmers in the world are, are thinking about this sort of stuff. Yeah, and and it's sort of gotten lost uh, as, as we go along and try to use visual pro programming for very concrete domains. Uh, it, it's hard to keep in mind these grand ideas. Yeah, obviously the industry has evolved and has become much more practical, uh, practically oriented, and that's a good thing in some sense. But um, it, it's it's good to just have this perspective. Uh, and so, yeah, this, this idea of these analogical representations, which are these physical representations of these ideas that you can kind of touch and feel, uh, lends itself to this type of uh, interaction called direct manipulation, where the objects are represented in the UI. You can um, you can take physical action on them, and you can, in fact, you can reverse those uh, those actions so things are not you know permanently broken. Uh, it's kind of inviting uh, way of of uh, interacting with things. Uh, and and also, I thought one very really interesting quote from the Pygmalion paper was. Uh, that the author called out the fact that when you go and talk to another programmer about their code, it's almost useless to just go and read the uh, the textual representation of the system. Like, you can, but it'll take you a really long time to basically do that kind of source code archaeology to figure out what's going on here. Uh, in fact, if you were to go up to the, uh, your fellow teammate or whatever and ask them, hey, how does this thing work that you made? The most conducive format that they'll probably do is take you to a whiteboard, right? And yeah. draw some uh, some diagram and then like walk you through it. They'll point to this or that and, and, uh, and kind of give you a spatial representation of their thought process. And so 
I thought that that still holds true today. And uh, and this was written, this paper was written however many decades ago. And I thought that was a very, right. very astute observation <laughs> that like, yeah, we do fall back to these kind of visual metaphors, even in the most professional software engineering environments. Yeah, I mean, to me, uh, that still speaks to how programming languages, despite the better affordances today, there's just still too much detail in the code because when you go into a new code base, like I think a lot of people lean on IDEs to be able to like run through things, right? Um, but if you don't, even if you have an ID to trace some execution, you still have to picture it in your head. There's very few programming environments that is also a debugger. Like Smalltalk's the only one I can maybe Lisp. Lisp and Smalltalk are the only two that I can really think of at the moment. But um, it's not like you can kind of run things in place and then see how they change things. Um, and so as a result, you get you have to do it in your head. And even if you don't, you don't get that high-level picture, which is what your teammate is drawing for you on the board. Yeah, exactly. Actually, a really great quote just completely came to mind from Richard Feynman, which is a super relevant to this topic. So it goes, let's say that you you heard about a particular species of bird. You can know the name of that bird in all the languages of the world, but when you're finished, mm -hmm. you'll you'll absolutely know nothing about that bird. You'll only know what humans call it in uh, all the different countries in the world. And so I think it's the same thing about uh, these these ideas that we're talking about here. When you read the source code and maybe you get into the details of the names of variables and these kinds of things, um, you do actually don't necessarily know anything about the nature of that system. It's not until somebody draws it out for you, walks you through how they think about it, that you actually understand, oh, this is this is how this works. This is how this, like, you know, pro uh, payments are processed or queries are are, are executed. Uh, you can just read the names of things, but you might not necessarily have any idea of the, the, the yeah. like, core essence of it. Yeah, and this kind of... I, I recently had an experience. Uh, like, I, I've been reading some papers on some... Uh, persistent data structure algorithms. And I found that sometimes when you read the paper, they skimp out on details because I think they're relying on the pros to paint a picture in your head to give you an intuitive sense, plus some like figures to, to give you a sense of like what is supposed to happen. And that's the equivalent of high level details of like your coworker talking to you. And so I think on one hand, that's helpful if you can understand the pros and like piece together the animation from paper figures of like what's supposed to happen. You can kind of fill in the blanks yourself. Alternatively, the dissertations have more details in them. And so sometimes they can include code. And so while the prose is like really skimpy, I'm like, I don't know exactly what's going on. When I read the actual algorithm, it takes a while to piece together. But once I have it, I understand what it's doing, but I have to paint that picture in my head myself. And mm -hmm. so that's where that that like visual programming part where if it was animated or something like that, then and I can step through it, then it, it makes it a lot easier. I think you, you talk about like the the dichotomy, but to, uh, I still don't know what that dichotomy is between the Freegan system like. Well, I don't know what a freaking system is, but you talk about the it's basically the between... words, the words versus the imagery. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, basically, yeah. there's a what is the non freaking system called? Visual, uh, a analogical. Oh, analogical. Yeah, and so I think when people try to merge the two, it's always side by side. And the thing that I want answered is how do you make both exist in the same space? Mm -hmm. so that okay, okay. so that you can do direct manipulation because i i think that's a large failure of a lot of visual programming languages D does that make sense what i'm saying yeah yeah, yeah it does i i think it relates to maybe that uh that link i sent you the poor programming portals like you can drop mm. you can drop it between the two representations right basically is that what you're saying like 
Well, like a uh, common example is like Markdown, where you have what it looks like on one side and then the Markdown on the other. I, I want visual programming languages to have the same property in which, like if direct manipulation makes sense, I would want that. And so some things that are very easily translatable to direct manipulation because there's an action, like you can work on the thing, but sometimes there's just not enough space or surface area to directly manipulate something. And mm-hmm. so how do you represent process over time yeah. with objects in direct manipulation? And so I've I've never seen any system that was really good at representing that. All right. Yeah. I, I, okay. So I see what you're saying. So basically, direct manipulation is useful for uh, certain types of interaction or a certain way of modeling uh, a system. Right. If you have a system in which there are concrete objects that have analogies to the real world or whatever mm-hmm. domain that you're modeling, but sometimes the things that we model are processes and processes over time don't lend themselves very well to specific metaphors that you can grab a hold on to. And, and so sometimes what we do is, so for example, for hypercard, you might have like things that you can hold like buttons, pages, whatever. But like when it comes to the behavior of things, like what happens when this gets triggered or its relationship to other things, or like mm-hmm. what are the things that need to happen like we break out into text. And so I've never really seen a visual programming language that successfully translates that part of the system into something visual. And I'm not sure that it should either because maybe sometimes like textual is the best representation for process, but that I'm not so sure of. Like maybe things should look like a timeline. Um or something yeah. else but but like or but ideally you would have both in the same space so that you don't have to like flip between one and the other because then it just kind of separates the two you get that divorce of like what you're manipulating which again is the script to say what the behavior is and the thing that's actually happening right like ideally if if like you believe that direct manipulation is a good interactive paradigm then you should technically be able to marry the two. I've only seen like maybe one example of where this has come together, but I I guess I wanted to hear your comment on this first. Yeah, I think that there might be some kind of like duality there, kind of like time domain versus frequency domain thing yeah, where yeah, yeah. you can basically look at one representation and then you can you can flip to the other representation and get a different perspective on the same thing, right? Where I, I get what you're saying that these these symbolic representations, such as source code or words, language, uh, are useful to maybe succinctly describe something that would otherwise take either time or space pictures yeah Yeah, too many too many pictures i mean there's a good reason we still have words like you like if you if you tried to paint a picture of can you go get me a beer tomorrow at 5 p.m or or something like that like that's that's hard to express in pictures right and so text is useful in certain contexts and so i i wonder if it's the same thing here in which we can't find anything better for describing processes things that mm-hmm. change over time or if that's not the case and we can find something that's better. I just haven't seen it. Yeah. I wonder if there's something like the visual dual to this symbolic representation of a time varying process. The, the dual of that is where you visualize the, the, a few unrollings of that loop for example, right? So, so you wouldn't actually want yeah. to make like a, a unrolled loop as the primary way in which you represent some time, you know, continuous time varying process. Right. That would be absurd. But um, in order to understand it visually, you could scrub through some timeline. Uh, you can visualize how uh, state varies over time. 
the internal state of objects or some type of variable, how it uh, varies uh, in response to other stimuli. And so that way you can visualize the parts of it that give you the intuition without having to be constrained by only using like a blunt instrument like a visual programming or only using symbolic programming. You can you can use one as a complement to the other. Yeah, and even debuggers, like that's the closest I can think of besides these yeah. experimental like like and debugger is like a one way timeline in which you can never go backwards either. So right. with the exception of the time traveling debuggers that uh that pure functional programming languages can enable, but like most debuggers out there, it's once you step beyond a point you have to go all the way back. What's that joke about computer scientists to test whether a car is working or not? You drive the car down and and uh, if it fa- crashes in the middle, you fix the car and you push the car all the way back up the hill and drive it down again <laughs> to see if it crashes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, debuggers are such a pain. Uh, and in fact, uh, in many professional programmers i know just use like printf debugging basically right they put yeah. print statements <laughs> i mean and, I, and I, I, <laughs> I also do that <laughs> yeah i do that too honestly i can't use like gdb or whatever for the life of me i have no idea uh but i think that that does say something about how it debuggers are insufficient for what we're trying to do like yeah. it is it is kind of like what i'm saying like you see the symbolic representation and maybe that is a succinct great like way to uh um, reason about uh static source code but then uh, when you want to see the static source code in action right the dynamic uh runtime version of it um the the debugger is not the right type of visualization or right type of abstraction we're doing something by littering these print statements and we're basically trying to figure out the trace of execution by looking at the order of these things, how they're interleaved. Yeah. Uh, maybe the delays between one or the other, like we're trying to basically create some kind of picture in our mind, uh, but I'm not sure exactly what we're doing there. I, I actually would be curious if there's some kind of research. Yeah. I, I don't know. In, in the, uh, it's it's a big question mark in my head right now, but like go yeah, I mean I, I agree. I think we're trying to do something there that that's not quite being fulfilled by debuggers. And as good as like even Chrome Dev Tools is for debugging, and admittedly I do that, and it's nice to be able to step through things without like having to put print statements in, find out that those weren't what you wanted, and then rerunning it again, right? Um, right. But, but I think where we're trying to do is obtain an observability into what the state of the program is to figure out what the heck is going on. Like, where is my assumption wrong about my understanding of the system? And so I, I think mm-hmm. that's, that's at least that's what I'm trying to do when I'm debugging. Like, what, what assumption do I have in my head that does not match what the computer is doing? And yeah. I guess tying it back to the direct manipulation it's that I want to be able to see. I want to be able to use my visual cortex to see the state of the system in addition to its process to be able to have an understanding of what it's doing without having to switch back and forth between two representations, even if they're side by side in a pane, mm-hmm. so that. I can directly manipulate something and see the changes immediately so that the iteration cycle is a lot shorter so I can be in the flow so I can better understand and experiment with what the heck is going on. Yeah, that makes sense. And actually, I like that you brought this up because visual programming is quite contentious. People view it as some type of enemy of or alternative to like mutually exclusive alternative to real programming (laughs) well it's it's (laughs) it's one of the most common things that i mean like assembly programmers hated like like uh what do you call it the program uh, programming languages when it came out programming yeah structured programming i mean like von neumann (laughs) 
like berated people for like making compilers because he's like he's so smart that he can write machine code by hand right but like compilers he's like this is a waste of machines time granted like machines were war- way more expensive than people back then but i mean like it's 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 a common thing uh, like when when you look at like the history of programming like people that are used to programming one era think that whatever came after like that's for kids sort of thing and so i think in some sense like the things that people are hawking that's new there needs to be some amount of skepticism into like whether this affords me the same power if not more along some dimension that i need to do my job but i think there's just a People are not optimistic about stuff. That that's for sure. That that's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think that the 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 other part about it is that it's easy to get caught up in only the surface level forms of direct manipulation. What I yeah. mean what I mean by this is that if you look at a direct manipulation language, let's take Scratch, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you look at this, you're like, well, this is great, but this is clearly for children because the only things that can be directly manipulated and visualized are like little cartoon cats and these types of things, right? Uh, the real things that I do as a professional are abstract concepts, which cannot be uh, visualized the way a picture of a cat would, right? And so visual programming and direct manipulation must be this uh, infantile uh, type of way of thinking, but and the <laughs> this attitude also happens to children that grow kind of grow out of Scratch. They're like Scratch mm-hmm. is great, but we know that real programmers with real jobs don't operate in environments like this. So we want to program in like those terminal things that we see. Like let's graduate. Right. To, Python or something like that. This is this is a common thing, and so making that transition is extremely difficult. Little yeah. do they know that we really want to be in those environments. <laughs> yeah, <honestly. laughs> exactly, exactly. And and I think we can be because the thing is that yes, right. Like obviously the the easiest thing to manipulate or to use direct manipulation on are things that have some tangible representation, like a picture of a cat or whatever. But you can apply direct manipulation uh, back onto programming itself in that what you're manipulating are not necessarily, okay, these abstract concepts, but you're manipulating the runtime state of your program. You're manipulating Mm -hmm. the, you know, speculative execution of, uh, you know, a branch of code or, or something like this, right? So there, there is a sort of meta domain, which is the, how your program is running. Great. Maybe you don't actually use visual programming exclusively to write your professional software, but mm-hmm. you can then utilize visual programming as a tool to reason about the software that you write in whatever other more professional language, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, if people use UI builders, it stands to reason that you could use other like visual tools to help with it. And so it may be that I know that at least for visual tools, one of my fears is that it doesn't work with any any of my other tools. Like, does it generate textual representations that I can use with Git? Or maybe we need like a version control that can handle some sort of standardized visual data format or something else or another. Like, I think okay. one of the other reasons is that our tools just aren't there to handle this sort of stuff either. Yeah, that's true. There's not necessarily interoperability uh, Mm -hmm. or, yeah, like if you use some other language, can it be uh, ingested by this visualizer? Yeah, maybe not. Um, Well, oh, oh, also I wanted to bring it back to the direct manipulation. I do want to bring it back to the one example that I can think of that shows the process code along with the thing that you're manipulating in the same existing in the same space and that example i can think of is from ink and switch uh, and their demo of crosscut and basically they also use the node and edge model but 
they bring in two kinds of edges and nodes. One is called meta ink and it's just colored a little bit different and those represents like the scripting or the process things and then the the black ones are the actual objects in the world that you manipulate which are also nodes and edges and so basically like if you can model processes with nodes and edges and the things that you're manipulating are nodes and edges and you can build um splines with these nodes and edges then you can build shapes with it and so that's how those two get to exist in the same space and so that's the only thing i can think of that has something like that but other than that i, I can't think of anything else oh weird that kind of reminds me of uh how lisp is is homo iconic right and all of its data structures are lists and then the program itself is uh, a list and you can write uh, yeah, programs yeah, that yeah, take yeah that right. take the list and manip- you know, do metaprogramming. I wonder, can right. you do this in CrossCut? Do you know? <laughs> I, I don't know, but <laughs> the, one of the, to kind of bring it back to the, one of the funny things about CrossCut is that if you have a like meta ink that uh, changes the uh, ink, like the, the things that you're manipulating, like sometimes if it's moving too fast, you can't actually grab onto it with your mouse. And so direct manipulation goes out the window if the thing that, you, that you're like running is moving too fast for you to grab onto to, to change or something like that. And so there are some problems with direct manipulation, right, um, which we haven't quite figured out yet. But like most of the time when you're simulating it in your head thinking, oh, direct manip- manipulation would be great, like we don't think of those edge cases. Or like ones where you change the position of the like the node, the, the ink node, and it travels off the screen and they're like, I can't get it back. Like how do I, I, I can't touch it to get it back. And so you have to like manipulate the, the meta ink to get it back. And so, uh, yeah, like there, there are issues like that. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But, but going back to the, the, I mean like that, that sense of like the direct manipulation is not for me. I, I think we're probably missing out on, on a lot because like, have you written plugins for, say VS code or like Vim and stuff like that. Cause my understanding is there's not a lot of plugins that give you visualizations. I mean, I don't think syntax highlighting counts. Are there even primitives right. to like draw stuff that I am unsure of? No, I have written a few Emacs plugins when I was trying to learn. Oh, oh I'm uh, so and... <laughs> super impressed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's so hard though. It's so hard. Uh, so no, it's not necessarily very friendly. Like the tools that we use, even modern ones like uh, VS Code, which do uh, use technologies like TypeScript and JavaScript, which uh, can render things to yeah, web browsers and things. They still be don't able to render, to, like, right? Yeah, yeah. But it but they still be able to. Don't. But they right? still but don't. People, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so that's what I don't know. Like I think that. The things that you do see that are visual visual plugins are things like, oh, well, it will take your React component and it'll display it on the side pane yeah. and just show you the rendered version, which is a pretty boring way of, like, that's the that's the easiest thing that you can imagine that you could do, right? It's like, well, you have this whole tool at your, at your fingertips. Like, what could, what else could you do? Yeah, I mean, I... I my ideal situation is not just like the running state of your program locally, but also running state in production or statistics of your code in production. Like if there are hotspots in your code or uh, potential security vulnerabilities. So basically like different overlays that you have besides like syntax highlighting, maybe there is security highlighting or, uh, speed highlighting or uh, common paths through the program so that you kind of get a sense of what's happening in production. Because right now, even the observability stuff is divorced from the code. It's not overlaid mm-hmm. on it at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and this actually reminds me a lot of uh, our discussion about small talk. One of the powers of small talk was that because everything was an object and and was able to be probed and manipulated 
within the runtime environment itself. Mm -hmm. It made it very easy for uh, people to, the end user to write what would otherwise be kind of system utilities to visualize right, right. Uh, processes, the their um, you know memory layout or their execution trace or then things like this. And so, um, yeah, that's probably the closest that uh, we've gotten, but also nobody uses Smalltalk. So yeah, nobody <laughs> has any idea about <laughs> how that Maybe works. it's an economics problem because like people, they couldn't grow an ecosystem around it because like people are like, oh, well, if everybody can build their own tools, we can't make any money. So maybe <laughs> that that's part of it. Thing. By the way, for our listeners, as we've said before throughout this program, we're going to have visual over- overlays in the video version of this podcast so check out that version if you want to see some of these things that we're discussing here um exactly yeah. and while you're there you know what to do yes Hit the bell. <laughs> subscribe anyway so moving on <laughs> moving on so so i think the these these like uh so just to kind of uh say oh where are we like we're talking about the concepts of uh visual programming and so before in the first part we kind of covered the specifics but like i don't think those specifics really inform like why people make these visual uh programming languages and so one of them is the 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 concept behind like a a thinking tool like how do people learn and think like uh, like being able to reify um or think uh, being able to not only manipulate symbols as a way of thinking, but also to manipulate objects so to to give another way of thinking. And then the second part is like the, the direct manipulation of stuff. So I can get in a flow. I can get a better intuition because like when you have direct manipulation of actual things, you can create metaphors that are very intuitive for humans because we live in a real world with like certain rules that we've become accustomed to. And so, yeah. move. Uh, so moving on, I think there are other concepts uh, for that inform visual programming. And so, I think one of the things that you were talking about is programming by example. Like, what 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 do you mean by programming by example? Yeah, I think that programming by example is is really in- interesting. Uh, you mentioned it before, but when we think about programming today. We think about telling the computer um, how to do something, right? So we say, do step A, B, C, and then this is how you get bake a cake or something. I don't know. Um, but programming by, well, by example, as, as it's as it's commonly taught and and uh, thought about, I guess. Yeah, we we think yeah. about it as a sequence of steps that you have to tell the computer. Yes, indeed, and that's that's certainly one way that a uh, that an outcome can be achieved, right? Is mm-hmm. that you give a very specific encoding of how uh, something should be done. Um, the other is kind of through inference, where you, as a user who's programming, tell the computer what to do, maybe by giving a few examples or demonstrations. So you say, uh, here's uh, an object, and uh, I want it to, for example, Uh, be transformed in this way, right? Change its shape in such and such way, or you take some input uh, and then, um, and then you give a few examples of a output. And then the computer is able to look at this and look at your manipulation of that object and say, okay, I get what's going on. This is what the user meant. And then is somehow able to encode that uh, into a routine that it's then able to repeat on other future uh, future things. And so you can think about it as like writing a function, but rather than writing the steps of the function, you kind of give it the inputs and outputs, and then it infers what the inside of that function should look like. Yeah, I think there's like all sorts of different colors of this that people may not call it by this name. Um, but I think about, well, so one... A common one is uh, genetic algorithms. Uh, I, I guess where people have written genetic algorithms to program what the body of a function should be if it gives it enough examples. And so it'll tune it to some sort of fitness function. But, uh, I mean, that's not a common thing. But I think a more common way 
but definitely less common than the how to do things, which we typically call imperative programming. I mean, the logic programming is, I think, kind of one example of that in which you state facts about the world and then you say the relationship between the facts and then the computer infers what those uh, things should be. And so that's another way, but less common, but it's definitely uh, used uh, nowadays in various domains. And um, there are other common ones in which you, uh, it's not logic programming, but we call it declarative programming where we say, this is what this thing should be. Um, you go figure out how to do it. And I think the com like most common ones are SQL. Uh, people don't think of it as a programming language, but it's definitely a, a give me this data and then the computer and the database figures out exactly how to fetch all that stuff from disk in what order um, and uh, mess around with all those details. Uh, similarly with like CSS, like how to display things, mm -hmm. um, that 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 is not done it's it's uh what should you display and then the computer will figure out exactly how to render that and so i think that those are kind of more common examples of programming by example and if you can squint your eyes and squint your brain a little bit like i tend to think of like unit tests as a poor man's <laughs> programming by example in yeah. which you play both the person giving the example and the person implementing the example, <laughs> right? Yes. Because yes. like logic programming is like you give a couple examples and the co computer figures out the implementation and gives you the answer, whereas in unit tests, you're doing both. Yes, if, especially if you're doing test-driven development where you write the tests first and then you use that to... Uh, basically bash at the code until you make all your tests go green, right? Like that's the canonical right, right. example. Right. Right, I think right. most people do it the reverse way and it's kind of cheap. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, so, so programming by example is really, really interesting because the user... The user stays in the mindset of the problem domain, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so they're thinking about the the objects and, and maybe the outcomes of what happens to those objects. They think about, in, in, in the case of SQL, they think about their data and what data that they want to pull. They don't then drop into some other type of abstraction of, you know, uh, traversing some uh, B tree or something and, and fetching yeah. rows. Uh, that's a different type of abstraction. And so programming by example does a very good job of letting the user live in the domain of the objects that they are working with. And I thought that it was interesting and surprising to learn about program programming by example because it almost seems like maybe until very, very recently that this type of inference was kind of like was a pie possible? in the sky thing. Yeah, it's like, oh. is, that, is this even possible, right? Are, are you thinking about GPT-3? Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I spoil the punchline? <laughs> no, no, I mean, <laughs> who isn't thinking about GPT-3 these days, right? Right, 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 right. Um, but, but now, now we are at the point of basically taking for granted that we have these few-shot learners, uh, which are machine learning algorithms that can take a handful of examples, and that's what they mean by few shot, and then use this to infer uh, behavior on future inputs, right? And so that this is all quite new, but w what I really liked uh, to kind of pull it back was that it's something new that's becoming much more accessible now, but the the early vision of visual programming almost just had this baked in the assumption that of course computers would be able to do this. Why would they not? Uh, and, and maybe that was overly optimistic and it took a lot of time to get uh, to the point where it is obviously possible. Uh, but I, I, I just really liked the kind of bravado of thinking about just even back then, 
like we're we're going to bake this in as a fundamental functionality to this kind of environment. Yeah, I think it's also because they didn't know what was possible and what wasn't. They were just rethinking programming from the bottom up. I mean, if you look yeah. at the Grail demo, like we were talking about the retro visual programming languages, like in a system that didn't have screens that used an oscilloscope for a screen, they had handwritten like handwriting recognition like you didn't use a keyboard you hand wrote letters and then it turned it into letters and they had that way back when and like i'm like whoa that's kind of amazing um but yeah like if you want to learn more about these like generative models with the gpt3 we do cover it in some previous episodes in the generative ai models in the multimodal and multitask models so you should check those out if possible um, but yeah, I mean, like, I think these these things are, uh, I think one of the exciting things is is being able to marry these new technologies to revive some of these older visions of what computing could be. And I think they're not without their problems. Like, what is it? The VS Code, GitHub Code Pilot, I think, has its share of things. And people are trying to figure out, have you tried it? I haven't tried it. Uh, I haven't tried it per se, but I've tried a different system, which is quite similar. Uh, it, it It's good, but uh, it's also kind of annoying. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean annoying? <laughs> uh, I, I think it's kind of like having a uh, overly e- eager person on a second oh, keyboard. I see. Kind of like <laughs> <laughs> interjecting. I see, I see, I see. Right, right. Not quite Jarvis level yet, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But there is still a little bit of lack of ambition, I feel, in in a concept like Copilot because it kind of feels like how we were talking about a, a debugger or something where it's like, yeah, this is great. This is obviously related to and useful for making, you know, writing traditional programs more efficient, but... I mean, I would be very, very interested in a programming environment that somehow just takes for granted the existence of GPT-3 and uses it as a kind of subroutine, right? Where rather than using these generative models to manipulate or help manipulate my symbolic code, I write symbolic code that calls out to GPT-3, which then infers what I want and then outputs, uh, uh, outputs what I want. Does that make sense? Like, uh, well, so fill in some of the details. Like, what what parts are being inferred? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what would be really, really interesting is if you think about unit testing. Uh, there's varying levels of abstraction in unit testing, but at one point, there is a type of unit testing, or at least test driven development which uh, I forget the name. It, there are tools like Cucumber. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it behavior BDD? driven? Yeah, yeah, behavior driven development. And the idea of this, and this was back in the like 90s or 2000s where like a bunch of agile people just made up stuff. But the, the idea was that your non-technical uh, product manager or your pointy haired boss or whatever would write these user stories or something using BDD, they would say, uh, I am a user, and when I click this button, then such and such thing will happen. And uh, they they write it in this kind of stilted way, and then you as a programmer then write all the code. You're basically the human inference machine that makes those stories true, right? Right. I mean, effectively, BDD, like Cucumber, like is is like they're trying to make a hyper card like script in which you were as the programmer was the computer (laughs) and you implemented it. Or you could say that they are the ones that are writing the examples. They were trying to get like program managers to program by example, but then you were the one that was like implementing stuff that that's effectively what it was. Yes, exactly. And so uh, I think what I mean, you know, when I say using these generative models, it's, it's exactly this is then can you take this kind of BDD user stories and then use that as programming by example by some other non-human inferencer, GPT-3 or something like this, which then uh, outputs uh, possibly source code, 
Uh, I'm not saying right, that you should right, re- use yeah. GPT-3, always make API calls out to GPT-3 for the rest mm-hmm. of your system's production lifetime. That would be yeah. absurd. But uh, as a kind of offline step, you take these BDD stories, output Python code, and then that way uh, it's a bridge between programming by example and um, traditional programming as we think about it. Yeah, actually one of the things I was thinking about was as an analogy was in reference to a level editor that I saw in a YouTube video before. And I was kind of impressed in that I thought that you built level editors in games stone by stone, path by path. But it turns out that some of these level editors are pretty sophisticated in that you can define a spline for where the wall should be, but you can drag the height of the wall or the width of the wall back and forth, and the computer itself will rearrange the stones on the stone wall so that it looks good. And then if you draw a path through the wall, it'll create an arch. And so the wider the path, the more ornate or like structurally sound the arch. And then Uh if you... uh make the path narrower it'll be more simple and so it gives a dynamic dynamicism to the details of the level and so that enables enables the level designer to focus on the high level details which in our world we would call essential complexity or the high level details or like the business domain logic whereas Mm -hmm. the computer was handling the details of like where every rock in the stone wall was placed, how the arches are, or like what the grass around that thing was look like. And so that's what I would say would be useful for GPT-3 to do. So then I can say my favorite topic, I guess, integrate with this third-party API. Like I want this data. And then it figures out how to fetch, like authenticate, log in the right rest api endpoint to hit and fetch me that data and then i can move on with my life and so in that way i can orchestrate the high level or like the domain specific logic of what i want to do without having to worry about these details about like external apis that i just don't it's not transferable knowledge i don't care to learn it and so right. that that's that's kind of my vision for for like being able to leverage gpt3 for these things so that yeah, like have GPT-3 handle the accidental complexity that we built into our system today that we're not getting away from. Yeah, and like you mentioned, once that kind of nitty-gritty uh, accidental complexity is abstracted away from you, you said yourself that you might prefer to think about things like API calls and ETL pipelines and this type of mundane things, you might prefer to visualize those using something like Zapier or some other uh, yeah. maybe node and wire type representation. Yeah. The reason in why the you don't necessarily... That, yeah, in the same way that like people might uh, flip over to a UI builder in Xcode or something like that, I want to flip to over to like a API builder or something like that, right? In, in my yeah. environment or IDE. Yeah, that sounds like a startup, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, we, go go and make that happen. <laughs> I feel like we're on a roll. Like I, almost every episode in the last, you know, couple of ones, we've come up with a billion dollar idea. So we're we're yeah. Honestly, like I envy Randall Monroe of XKCD. I think he has the best programming like lang- visual programming language in the world. He draws a comic about something and then like legions of engineers just implement it for them for shits and giggles right (laughs) like the runtime has a lag time of like weeks if not months but like he he doesn't have to do much there besides draw i guess and come up with the concept but but like he he's he's programming by example (laughs) (laughs) and now now the layperson can too so when it comes to like visual programming languages like what do you think Where do you think its strengths are and how is it applied to programming? Because we can see that visual programming seems to blossom in 
very specific domains such as visual effects, music, um, certain parts of game engines in which there's that data pipeline that I mentioned, functional data pipeline that I mentioned before. But like, is, is there like a concept or principle? Do you think that that it has uh, strengths besides the things that we mentioned, or we can reiterate like exactly how those concepts apply to specific domains. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to to just enumerate those. We mentioned them in passing, but um, yeah, what are what are some some of the domains where it it really really excels? Yeah, I mean the things that come to mind are the examples that we covered, which are visual effects, musical effects, and with the block uh, programming environments, it's uh, pedagogical, where you know you're trying to teach people programming. Um, those seem to be the narrow domains in which it really excels at the moment. Um, yeah, and because of the requirement to reify concepts that you can manipulate, I think it makes sense for functional programming uh, or declarative programming of some sort. That's why like, you can actually have UI builders because you're manipulating things. Mm -hmm. But yeah. when it comes to processes or th things that we think of as typically imperative programming, I don't think... It's a very good fit, at least with the visual elements that we have today. Um, mm -hmm. Again, going back to the the sort of two ways of representing ideas, like are the yeah. analogical or the linguistic. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that it says is the difference between these two, uh, other than the obvious one is visual and one is not, is that the visual or analogical things that can be directly manipulated live in a kind of continuous state space. What, what I mean by this is that um, if you have an object or something that's in a 2D or 3D canvas, you can nudge it, right, by mm -hmm. arbitrarily infinitesimal amounts, right, up to mm -hmm. some limit. Uh, or you can stretch it a little bit, or you can do, like, small little tweaks to it. The state space mm -hmm. allows you to do this. Um, and the, the flip side... Uh, something like words and symbols are discrete in that there isn't really, really a concept of like, what does it mean to nudge a word a little bit more, um, you know, to be a little bit more negative, right? Can you nudge that word to be a little less like this and more like this? Not really, not in the representations that we have. Right, not in the representations <laughs> we have. I was going to say, well, we have embedding spaces. Like yes. we can do math on words in embedding spaces. But like yes. barring that, yes, I, I yep. would agree with that. Yeah, so I think that's currently the best del delineation that I can think of is that visual programming can only operate on objects which lend themselves to this kind of continuous representation. Uh, if something oh, is a discrete yeah, yeah. representation, yeah. then mm -hmm. you're kind of screwed because then you need discrete operators and things which are not inherently visual. I don't know why. That's, it seems yeah. that way. I don't know why. I, I want to say that where the visual part is good is that you get to work with concrete examples i guess i, I mean like we oh I, I and with concrete examples you can draw understanding with metaphors uh, i think that's one of the strengths of visual programming is that you can draw on metaphors that people are familiar with day to day because I think maybe one of the reasons why monads are so hard even for programmers to grasp is that they're so abstract. And I think the way that you learn about monads best is if you find concrete examples. And concrete examples in our world is still abstract, right? Like the concrete examples you're is what you call concrete is basically things you're already familiar with and you have an intuition with, right? People think 
say, oh, be concrete, like talk numbers, but actually numbers are pretty abstract already. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and, and so it, it, I think it's the same thing. And so I'm not sure how you would reify monads, but if there were a way to do it in which you can leverage a metaphor that people would have in real life besides astronaut suits and burritos, which aren't very good metaphors, then maybe that could aid in understanding like what they actually are. And so I think if done right, I mean, uh, visual programming has that advantage over um, text, I think. The reason why this is so powerful is because you don't have to explicitly say everything and you get a whole bunch of understanding that comes along for the ride. And so when you have a metaphor of, say, a file, like you understand that, oh, a file is something you can write on and maybe put away and organize, right? When So like the GUIs that we have nowadays is the desktop metaphor. And now it's abstracted a little bit, but when it first started, it was like, oh, a file is that some thing that is like a document you can write to it and you can file it away and maybe you can search for it later on just like a regular filing cabinet and these metaphors are ways that you can say very little but get a lot of understanding um and so i think this is akin to what i mentioned with dynamic land in which in order to make a list in dynamic land you just order the pieces of paper in a list and if you want to reverse it you just reverse that list it leverages the real world as part of its program and so then it can shed a lot of the details and uh, to the physical world and you can focus on the domain logic and mm -hmm. it's the same thing here with the visual programming in that if you can use visual programming to connect this concept in silico to some real world thing as a metaphor, then you get a whole bunch of under understanding for free. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's really interesting. Like yeah. we, we've been so far talking about how can we take com representations of computer objects and make it uh, so that humans can understand them. But there's also the, the reverse element, which is the limitation of a lot of programming languages and environments is that uh, they operate on kind of computery abstractions, yeah. Um, like files, for example. Like, what the hell right. is a file? Well, the file is just some abstraction that a computer happens to be good at manipulating. Uh, but a uh, file, people don't think about files. Uh, if you think about uh, as a human, you look at a file and you understand its nature, its contents. Right? You see, like a picture you visualize the contents of that file. You don't think about it necessarily just as a, uh, a, a bunch of bytes like a computer mm -hmm. would. And yeah. so I think one thing that's really exciting uh, that I think uh, visual programming can uh, grow into and become more widely uh, applicable is as computers are able to understand the semantics and the contents of data rather than simply their representation, their symbolic or syntactic representation, um, you will have a rich set of operators that can operate on domains that previously were not possible. A good example is that yeah. you could have some visual programming language which operates on visual effects and video uh, and by applying filters, right? It just uh, applies some uh, uh -huh. convolution or something over the pixels. Yeah. But that is still at the abstraction of bytes and pixels. But can you now have a, a visual programming language pipeline which operates on the semantics of the video itself? It takes a video of a person and it swaps their face uh, or it makes the person look taller or yeah. it changes the background. You know, it, it understands the nature of the video, the content of the video, not just the the uh, surface level fact that it is a video file. Yeah, yeah. I, you're talking about like how do we have operators 
at the domain, like business domain, right? I think it's akin yeah. to the analogy I drew with the level editor earlier in the episode where like, how do we talk about operators at the level of detail that I care about that I'm operating at the moment and then have the computer handle all the details. And so right now we have to have somebody drop down one level and fill in all those details uh, for you and they may not necessarily do a great job but then um sometimes we wish the computer to do it but like so far we haven't been able to do that until relatively recently because programming common sense into computers was really really tough because they have no embodiment in the real world so they don't have any common sense yeah. and so as a result, and we didn't know how to like encode that common sense until relatively recently. And so maybe that's another way to frame it in which we want somebody with common sense to fill in the details for us mm -hmm. so okay. that we can focus on the problem at hand. And hopefully they do it in like a fast way or like our results are fast right i think that's kind of where we're where we're kind of circling this this idea at the moment right yeah exactly and i think that even if you look at the 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 domains in which visual programming is succeeding so i gave an example of video right a video pipeline yeah. uh, a surface level video pipeline versus a, some semantic video pipeline and i think yeah. similarly uh where you talked about max uh, msp and audio effects well that's still operating at the level of just abstract signals right audio mm -hmm. signals uh, yeah. it's not operating at the level of music right it's operating at the level of noise and so what does it look like then could you have a, a semantic uh, pipeline that yeah, takes like the make, music make this, and makes it yeah makes it feel a little sad or like yeah. make it more like uh, like the Harry Potter movie, but more jovial, right? Something like right. that. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I think especially paired with the recent AI sort of uh, generative models, it, it has the potential to do a lot more here and fulfill some of the original vision, like um, that the original originators of computer programming back in the 50s and 60s, where a lot of this work was done, um, to see what is possible. Yeah. 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 There's something about this that feels like it could either get out of hand or completely hard to control like CSS, uh, mm -hmm. where <laughs> it would be like that, that gif of Peter Griffin trying to shut the blinds. <laughs> I mean, right. like if, if you've ever seen that, like it's the only caption on that meme is CSS, right? And so uh, it could be frustrating to have to have an assistant that just gets all the details wrong or something slightly wrong. But I think there probably needs to, people will figure out how to build in mechanisms to do fine tune adjustment of the details if they need to. And that, that probably will have to be the case as we try to teach computers common sense for our particular domain. But I, I think generally the idea seems to hold up. Yeah. Yeah, I think in one of our previous episodes, we wondered how spells are made in Harry Potter because, mm -hmm. like, if they have engineers of stuff, like, how is everything just not a mess all the time with people doing this stuff? <laughs> um where like spells just don't work like if their world is anything like our world like things just half work all the time like why is it not like that <laughs> right um and so maybe maybe with this sort of fine-tuned tweaking that that's kind of how you narrow things in because then you don't have to figure out some of the details you just ask the computer to kind of go fix this one part and and then keep iterating say no 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 until you got yeah something like this do more like that so maybe maybe through that iterative process it'll 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 be possible hmm and so i guess uh pulling it back to like other use cases i i think the the one last thing about visual programming is more akin to the edward tufty line of thinking 
uh, Edward Tufte built his career out of trying to communicate to the larger public that you can have information dense visualizations of data that hack your visual cortex to convey that information with a lot of density. Uh, and he's written three books on that. And so I think visual programming also has the ability to leverage our visual cortex so that we can understand the state of a system much better. And currently we don't really do that all that much besides the occasional chart and going to the whiteboard, really. I think like going to the whiteboard is our version of leveraging our visual cortex, but I think we can do so much more there. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's really interesting because proponents of data visualization, the reason why they're such big proponents is, in fact, there's some data which gets hidden when you represent it in certain ways, which then mm-hmm. just pops. It's like there's some anomalous value yeah. or some trend or something, which mm-hmm. just becomes immediately obvious when you represent it in the right way because we're just really good at picking up certain spatial relations or maybe yeah. visual relations. Yeah, um, and like uh, that that is because of our evolutionary heritage. And, I mean, like spotting motion, uh, it, it, we're very good at that or like being able to compare if something is longer or shorter at a glance. Like we can immediately tell things that are obvious. Um, and so like data visualizations data visualizations just leverage that to the T when you do it right. And I I don't know what the equivalent would look like for like visual programming environments that leverage this to expose state. But I Mm -hmm. I think this is an underexplored area that um, we could definitely do more of. So I'm saying like we, we, wouldn't necessarily get rid of text, but I guess we touched on it that why do ID plugins don't help me with this? I there I think yeah. there's probably a lot more that can be done there. I actually okay, I'm gonna double down on this. I think that that's what printf debugging or print statement debugging is all mm-hmm. about. Because when I a lot of the time do print statement debugging. I'm printing out some value uh, or some string yeah. that I'm working on or a dictionary mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. And the time, the way that I can tell that something is wrong is I see some value scroll by and I'm like, Hey, that's a little too long or, Oh, that has some kind of weird characters in it, which like don't look like the string that I was expecting. Right. right? Or, or even things like timing cues. Like I can say, Oh, there was like a weird interleaving of, these two statements in a way that I don't expect. And it's not that I'm sitting there diligently reading them. I can just tell by the shape of the letters as they scroll by on my log. Yeah. Hey, something is not how I expect it, you know? So like somebody that's standing behind you think that like, you're like the uh, programmers in matrix where like you're looking at like code, (laughs) so to speak, and it's just scrolling by, but really like you're trying to leverage your visual cortex to stop spot some sort of pattern that you built an intuition uh, for over time. Right. Like you're just looking for things that just doesn't quite look right. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 yeah, it's using all the cues that are part of my embodied self, vision, mm-hmm. a sense of passage of time or motion or or whatever, all those things that, that you mentioned, which I'm not consciously thinking of, but mm-hmm. I'm utilizing uh, in place of conscious thought, and it's helping me with this, this problem. Yeah. And so I think that's underexplored. The, yeah. I, I mean, the Stephen Wolfram argued for this in his book, book a new kind of science in which he generated a lot of visualizations of cellular automata and one of the things that didn't strike a good chord with other scientists is like he's like this is complex and this is not we're just gonna like rely on our visual cortex i think in a hand wavy way he's right like you can see like when something is simple when something is repeating and when things are like chaotic complex Mm -hmm. but like he didn't have like an exact 
way to measure that. He's just saying, oh, we could see it, right? And so obviously that wouldn't sit well with the larger scientific community. But in, in that way, at least for the purpose of our argument, that like he's not wrong, right? Like we have these visual cortex that can tell that this thing is not like that thing, right? Like you, you can mm-hmm. tell at a glance that like this this uh, complexity it's a certain type of complexity, right? It's not chaos. It's not completely random, but it's not like a repeating sort of thing. It's like somewhere in between. And so, so I I think that, that uh, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, Also, uh, this is another example that I wasn't able to recall again in my research, but like at some point in the past, I had come upon a research paper in which they tried to invent glyphs to represent the types of functional uh, programming functions. So, Because sometimes when I'm doing functional programming, getting the types to match up is a pain in the ass. Like I have to like play type puzzles in order to get the types to match, especially like when I'm doing like chaining monadic things together. And their argument was that, why don't we do this visually so that you can visually see whether two functions fit together? But I wasn't able to find that that paper again. But that that would be an example of something that would be really nice so that you can see at a glance whether two functions can be chained together or not. And if not, what is that missing piece? What is that type that that is missing? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh I think that this is this is again a different type of visualization than what people typically think about as visual programming and I think this yeah. is you know to just drive home the point the appeal of visual programming lies in these deep concepts and not necessarily in the surface forms of of how uh how visual programming environments are today so these are all examples of things that are emerging uh, and and new and this is this is a, a what a visual programming could let us do that we otherwise aren't able to do. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's what's new, right? Uh, let's say that all of this comes to fruition, and visual programming it becomes a new paradigm that everybody is using. What are the second and third order effects? Well, the immediate thing that comes to mind is the same thing that people say about end-user programming. You would get uh, basically prosumers of computers being able to do their own thing without having to hire or rely on an engineer. So I guess engineer pay would go down and the demand for them would go down. You'd get more entrepreneurs and more artists doing dynamic art. And so I think those are like kind of the the immediate sort of things. But I guess more than that, it would be a it would increase computer literacy so that people that can write can write their own to do list. They may not be able to write novels, but they'd be able to do their own to do list. So you'd have a little like I guess cottage industries of people doing stuff. Um and so if that were the case You might still get I, I was wondering if you would still have industries that cover those use cases. Like would people that write to do lists still have an economy of to do list makers? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I mean like we buy like scratch pads with to do lists written on them. Yeah. Pre written. <laughs> <laughs> because we w- we want something else from it, right? Whatever the cute illustration is. So I I don't think that all those things will kill it off or or make it go away. But I th- at least the the hope. Maybe one way to think about it is that the hope and the vision of Alan Kay and Seymour Papert will actually be realized, where people can think computationally, meaning that they can use these models, dynamic models, to simulate a dynamic system and be able to understand it in a way that they couldn't before. And so maybe like you could get better understanding of the dynamics of 
for like any particular public policy, at least like in an outline form. Like if you, Mm. so for, for complex systems, there is a program called NetLogo in which you can kind of do these sort of things today, but I don't think it's very popular within public policy or anything like that. And so maybe if visual programming were as pervasive as Excel, then maybe people will use those things to model things that are going on rather than just using an Excel as a way to model how a particular system or would react. So maybe, maybe something like that. Yeah. I think I get what you're saying. Uh, but basically like if, if there's a literacy, a computer computational literacy for dynamic systems in which, uh, we can understand these things a little bit better or have a better intuition for it. Because like today, I think we have certain type of thoughts that would be considered really abstract before, but Mm -hmm. we kind of do it um, more naturally. So so you're saying that uh, computational thinking or access to uh, this type of um, simulations or something using visual programming or easy access to programming will allow us to develop more such novel intuitions. I mean, if Alan Kay and Seymour Papert is to be believed, yeah, I, okay. I think that's the case because like the more that you see concrete examples of things over time, you can build a better intuition for it. It's just that the feedback cycle for using computers to look at dynamic systems is so slow and requires such arcane knowledge that most people don't do it and the best thing that we have right now is excel and once like people grabbed onto it and gravitated towards it when it was good enough for them to use for those sort of things and at best right now those are just tables of numbers right you Mm. could do more there you could do more i think yeah i think that uh there there is something interesting there because we have seen, even in the last decade or so, with visualization libraries like D3.js come out, there's been an explosion of a new type of like computational journalism in which mm-hmm. uh, stories are told through... Oh, through data, yeah. Through data. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. I think on the back end as well, not just conveying to the user, but they might also be applying computational computational techniques to mine through uh, things like the Panama paper leaks and uh, these large uh, Mm -hmm. troves of data to find a story. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think journalists are on the cutting edge of that. Uh, But yeah, Yeah, there there are so many others to a data set is, is one of the tools that, uh, is built for journalists to kind of, or or anybody really like to be able to just take a bunch of data and be able to publish it quickly and be able to explore it. So so yeah. Let's say that we want to take a position on this. You know, either us or our viewers. How can they take a bet on on the future of visual programming? I mean, I guess one obvious way is to build the tools in the specific domains that you think will uh, get adoption there. I don't know how to answer this question. I think think it's um, a little bit harder to answer this question for this topic. Well, I think one way is that we've seen this pattern we've discussed this pattern a couple times in this in this episode that visual programming really becomes natural and lends itself to domains where you can delegate to uh, the computer or to some inference algorithm or whatever 
the nitty gritty details of how something is done. So then you think about the high level composability, uh, the flow of the task at hand. And so I think one way to take a position of, about this is to assume that fairly soon all tasks or at least most tasks that we currently imagine would require a human being or a human assistant, all of those tasks could be equally done by a computer inference algorithm. Then what would a visual programming-like environment look like for domains that previously required a human in the loop, right? Um, yeah, thinking about it now, like especially if you're a graphic designer or like an interaction designer, like this, the the field is wide open. There's just so much that can be done that is underexplored. Like we've just been doing GUIs to death, but there's all this other stuff. Um, and so that, if you want to take a bet on that, like just start looking at the problems in representing program processes and program state and that there's there's a like a rich field of possibilities there or even the broader question of how do you tell computers what to do um yeah that that is that i think if you're gonna take a position on that 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 would be like one way to approach it i think we should <clears throat> rewind back up the stack of history uh, and uh and really take a page from these early visual programming pioneers who were basically thinking from first principles about, like you said, how do we tell computers what to do? And they were thinking about things like programming by example and uh, programming by constraints and these types of things. And now that we have much more computational power and much more capability than even they had, I think we should do the same and run the same exercise. Uh, and rather than doubling down on this lineage of structured programming, Algol-like languages, et cetera, et cetera, and then just simply layering more stuff on top of that. Yeah, I guess it's it's the th entire theme of our entire episode in that Visual programming isn't just what you've seen or had a bad experience with. It's the core concepts behind the question of how do we tell computers what to do? And, you know, programming is one thing. And back then they came up with all this stuff because it was still unknown at the time, like, how to do it. And I think given that there's still interest in visual programming, I don't think we figured out the way. I mean, I'd be hard pressed to think that we found out the way after a couple decades when people took a long time to figure out how to write well. And uh, math notation took a while to evolve as well. And it was only relatively recently that math was expressed in notation it, like if you look at some of the older stuff it was expressed in prose and right. you know uh and so uh, there's probably just a lot of work there and to take a position i guess it goes back to hey like look at what people were thinking back then maybe need to take a tour of computer history not like just what machines were made but like what, what were the concepts like what were people thinking about when it comes to the human computer uh, boundary and interactions and so yeah there's probably a rich vein there to revisit definitely uh yeah and i, I think people are exploring it um so we'll, we'll see what comes out and like i said within a year I would <laughs> imagine that somebody's going to crack this nut. That's yes. my that's my bet. <laughs> yes. And cool. so with that, I guess our optimism and enthusiasm is I don't know, pretty pretty optimistic I say. Like we we we're painting a picture of a world in which computers are are intellectual companions rather than just things that we just kind of tell stuff to. Like they can also leverage our most developed sense to be able to do some of the 
processing of understanding for us. And so I think, I mean, I, I would want to do more of that because honestly, like some of our computer com- c- systems are so complex now that uh, it's, I'm having trouble keeping up, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, we're just we're just building on top of yeah, like shaky shaky ground, uh, I think. But yeah, I think uh, there is there is there is reason to be optimistic. If this episode opened your eyes, check out our other episodes where we talk about the other edges of technology, uh, why they're interesting, and the future that they point to. Uh, and if you Uh, like a lot of our videos subscribe so you find out uh, all our newest episodes and be sure to check out our audio versions on apple podcasts or spotify and it would also help us a lot if you write us a review to help bring other techniamistas on board so uh, with that this is Sri, and this is will i will see you next time see ya take care we'll see you next episode Bye-bye.